name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. In our first reading this morning, we read of the anointing of David. And it's such a wonderful story. He's so unlikely to be the king of Israel that he's not even invited to the little sacrifice and choosing ceremony. He's out keeping the sheep. Uh, and yet we know the Lord has chosen him. When I read this again, I was thinking a lot about King David. I was thinking about his predecessor, King Saul, who's, who's out for Samuel as this morning's reading began. I want to put before you both of their stories this morning and, and just to see what these, uh, if we look at both of their lives, what spiritual lessons we can learn from these two kings. Because at so many points they are exactly alike, David and Saul, uh, and at so many points in their journey they are incredibly and profoundly different. There's a really important lesson in this for us. So here's 1 Samuel 9, verse 17. It reads this way. When Samuel looked at Saul, the Lord said, This is the man that I have told you of. He will rule my people. And then Samuel took a horn of oil and anointed Saul's head. Fast forward seven chapters now from this morning's lesson from 1 Samuel 16. Finally, the Lord said to Samuel, Now take a horn of oil and go to Bethlehem and find a man named Jesse, for I have selected one of his sons to be the new king. And after all of them had passed by, they bring David in, and here's what it says. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed David in the presence of his brothers. So the two great kings of Israel, David and Saul, have extraordinarily similar beginnings. Both are called to be the king. Both are anointed by the prophet Samuel. Both are called to this royal service in a time of great need in their nation. Both are called when they're very young in their youth. Most importantly, both are called by God. But when you look at their endings, these two kings that had such similar beginnings have remarkably different endings to their life. Fast forward with me to the end of David's life. He's had long years of leadership that are coming to the end. He gathers the princes of Israel. He's frail, but, but with power and fervor, he delivers this final, beautiful, dying charge. First, he says to the people of Israel, Keep and seek all the commandments of the Lord your God. And then he calls his son Solomon close to him. He says, pay close attention to the ways of the Lord our God. Walk before him in faithfulness, and you shall lack nothing. And then his life ends. The great King David, uh, who scripture says, was the man after God's own heart. But if you know your Bible, you know that Saul's last moments were tragically different. Saul is on the plains of Shunem. Uh, he's aware that the Spirit of God has left him. He's in the midst of a, uh, of a battle, of a fight. He's frantic. He sees his sons killed before him, Saul does. He's wounded, and then he ends up taking his own life. Falls on his own sword. And that's the end of his life, despair and dishonor. So we think of the two kings of Israel, we know that their beginnings are incredibly similar. Their endings, very different. And so that leaves us with the question, what happened? Why the big difference between these two endings, between their two legacies? Now, uh, as a kid who grew up watching way too many commercials... Uh, maybe the Nike ads are right, is what I want to tell you this morning. That in times of, of great tension, when the heat really gets turned up, how we behave in those moments, perhaps it really does uh, determine who we really are. 
those critical moments in our life, they reveal something about our inmost being. And I think that is definitely the case here for these two kings. So for David, his critical moment, and you'll remember this, centers around the matter of Uriah the Hittite. You'll remember that Uriah is the husband of Bathsheba, and David was lusting after Bathsheba. He wanted Bathsheba all for himself, and he wanted Uriah out of the picture, if you remember that. And so he sends Uriah to the front lines of the battle to have him killed, precisely so that he can commit adultery with Uriah's wife. It's a scumbag move if there ever was one in the Bible. That's the great King David. Afterwards, he's confronted by the prophet Nathan. If you remember that confrontation, it's one of the most famous exchanges in Scripture. Uh, Nathan tells him a little parable about a man who has one little sheep and another rich man who has, has many of them. And he wants his one little lamb, the poor man's one little lamb. Nathan basically accuses David of not only taking another man's wife, which he did, but also just of having so much and yet wanting even more. Well, in this confrontation that happens, we see the real David, the repentant David. After he's confronted, he says with trembling lips, I have sinned against the Lord. was David's moment of crisis. That was his defining moment in his life, and David was found to be humble. He was found to be repentant. Now, Saul also has a, a critical moment, a revealing crisis. Uh, it, this moment finds him returning victorious from battle against the Amalekites. Saul is Victorious, He's the big winner that day. And Saul, he doesn't do something sinful like David did. And in fact, in his revealing moment, uh, he shows mercy. Saul shows mercy. He spares King Agag in that day's battle. But in sparing Agag and, and by sparing the, uh, the Amalekites and, and the people take for themselves the, the loot from the day's battle. Uh, this is directly in conflict with what God tells him to do. Uh, because, you see, God had told Saul to wipe out completely the Amalekites. And so Saul stood that day disobedient to the Lord's direction. And then there's a confrontation, a similar moment to the one that David had. Uh, Saul gets confronted by the prophet Samuel. And instead of repenting, and instead of admitting wrongdoing, Saul tells Samuel a lie. Saul's response to the, the confrontation, it's really kind of classic uh, avoidance stuff. First, he outright denies that he's done anything wrong. Second, when he's pressed a little bit further by Samuel, he willingly confesses the guilt of others, but still maintains his own innocence. And then finally, when he is confronting with the chilling word of God's rejection, Saul still places responsibility on others. He says, I feared the people and obeyed their voice. So two kings, and in their stories we see a, a, a winding thread that runs all throughout the scriptures and really all throughout history, uh, from, from Adam and Eve in the garden to the, the scandals that we see on the news uh, every single day. What we see is the blaming of someone else. Blaming of someone else for personal failings, for personal weaknesses, for mistakes we make. And that is the difference between David and Saul. 
You can call it uh, making excuses. You can call it alibis. You can call it scapegoating. You can call it whatever you want. But recognize this as a behavior that uh, binds and cripples and ultimately destroys men and women who live a lie. Men and women who are constantly blaming others rather than accepting responsibility themselves. The difference between these two kings, the difference between uh, triumph on one hand and, and tragedy on the other, comes down to the inability of Saul to accept responsibility for his own actions. There's a psychologist, an author, he tells a story of his son receiving a D on his report card. And when he saw his son's D on his report card, he went and asked his son about it. And the son compl complained, the, the teacher is, is ridiculous. The teacher is uh, so mean. Uh, she gave me uh, the D. You can see, see, it's in her handwriting, Dad. You gave me the D. And his dad tells the story, he says, no, 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 no. That is not the way that works. She recorded your deed. That's your deed. You earned it. She didn't give it to you. You earned that for yourself. There's all kinds of times in life where we have to Take responsibility. We have to say, I made that D. All kinds of times in life uh, where we have these defining moments. We make a mistake. Something doesn't go the way that we uh, hoped it would go. We have a failure along the way. And we have a choice that we can make. The blaming of others. The blaming of circumstances, time and time again, the effect accumulates over time if we live our lives that way, and it actually blinds us, ultimately, to our actual weaknesses. And if we get blinded to our weaknesses, then we will never become people that can grow. And that's where Saul ends up. It ends up, his life, he's... he's frantic as his life is unwinding on him and instead of uh, admitting his sin, instead of letting go of his sin and leaving it behind uh, there, if you remember in the darkness of night, he reaches out to the witch of Endor and even in the darkness of his life, he's searching for the darkness to save him. He can't stop and look within Sure, Saul, he, he, he sinned, but uh, David sinned in a much uglier way. And the tragedy was, was not that he sinned. The tragedy was that he could never accept responsibility for his sin. He could never face it, with God's grace, confess it, and leave it behind him. And that is the difference between the two great kings of Israel. For David, the admission and the recognition of his guilt, it was the saving of his soul. So, with all that in mind, with the little bit of Lent that we have left, we're invited to stop and take some time to look deeply within. We can follow Saul, or we can seize this opportunity that we're given to follow David. Seize the opportunity to take responsibility for the things that are part of our lives that we wish weren't part of our lives. Take the responsibility, confess them, and put them behind us. Two kings and two paths. Which one will we choose?